I am Betty Collins, and this is Inspiring Women, a podcast presented by my company, Bradyware. This is the podcast that advances women toward economic, social, and political achievement. And I, Betty Collins, am here to inspire you today on your journey in life, which includes so many things. This is all about you. I am thankful that you're listening, but more importantly, that you're investing time in yourself. You can find more about inspiring women in this episode on the resources tab at bradyware.com. So today we're going to talk about connection and, you know, how do you do that in, in the world today that has been in experiencing and still is experiencing this pandemic? I promise you that we are not going to talk about COVID-19. But I am going to talk with a guest who will leave you inspired to leverage the benefits of this virtual environment so you can kind of create a personal connection and thrive because we all crave that, right? And there are days I think, oh, by June we'll be at events again. And then some days I go, I don't know that's going to be June. So we got to learn to do it virtually. You know, we got to learn to still have connection. And so this guest I think is going to do that. You know, I personally struggled for me. For I'm a people person. I get energized when I'm around others, whether it's, you know, with, with work, peers, my family, friends, church, all of that. I love the buzz of my office, especially when it's full and everything's going. Now, I will tell you, I still treasure and, and very much uh, want to be out there with live events, but we'll do that in time. And I also have learned in the last year for sure that I can be energized by an empty house at a slower pace. So today we're just going to talk about how do we make connection. And and I want to do that. I have an amazing guest today, Michelle Tillis Letterman. And she is a people expert who inspires organizations and individuals to build real relationships and then get results from that. Having worked with organizations large and small, she's identified the common struggle. It's people challenges. Imagine that. A former pastor of mine used to say his job would be so much easier, imagine as a pastor, if he didn't have to deal with people. Well, that he wouldn't be much of a pastor then, right? Of course he was kidding, but it was a struggle for him in how did he connect. So, you know, there's, there's a, those of us who are people, people, and then there's people who have to be that based on what they do. Well, Michelle began her journey to training and speaking when she became disheartened by the lack of leadership and communication she experienced in corporate America. I am a CPA. She was smarter. She is a recovering CPA who spent over a decade in finance. And Michelle's shift began when she wanted to teach hedge fund advisors how to convince her to invest. Michelle realized that she was a teacher at heart and began designing her own ideal career. It was this change that led her to start Executive Essentials, a training company that provides communication and leadership programs, as well as executive coaching and services to enable others to excel professionally. She's highly respected and endorsed. And Michelle lives in New Jersey with her husband and two sons and two rescue dogs, which I saw on her website. They're beautiful. She's authored a book, The Connector's Advantage, as well as three others. And today I want to focus on making the most of this new normal. So Michelle, welcome to the program. Thank you for your time today for being with us. My audience, I are honored that you're here to share, give us perspective and inspire us. So first, just give us a little, tell us a little bit about you. Well, thank you for having me on. Uh, Well, you already mentioned I'm an animal lover, uh, especially of those rescues. I'm a travel and adrenaline junkie, I have been to, I think, about 70 countries at this point, and my kids have already been to 20, and they're oh. still in their early teenage years. Wonderful. Um, what else about me? I, um, I'm i 4 foot 10. That's okay. a unique piece, piece of information. <laughs> there you go. Um, and, and I love to share those aspects about myself because I always say that people don't connect about what we do, but what we like to do. Yeah. And so if there's scuba divers out there or anybody's ever jumped out of a plane, um, or if you have always had a dream of bottle feeding a Siberian tiger, Mm. which I have, and you can see the pictures on my Facebook page, um, yes, (laughs) then we have something to talk about. And so when somebody says, tell me about you, I don't tell you about what I do, but I tell you about what I love to do. Right. And I always like to start with that question because I want to get the audience to have exactly what you're talking about. 
this is who I yeah, this is who I am. It's what I love to do. I'm also a travel junkie. Love it. I don't know how many countries I've been in, but um, I absolutely love it. Didn't get to start till I was about forty. So thank you for sharing that with us. So you're a recovering CPA. Good for you. Tell us why that you went from the CPA to the company. I mean, I talked a little bit about it, but let me hear it from your side. You know, it's interesting. Um, one of the mindsets of a connector that we'll talk about is abundance. Mm-hmm. And um, the opposite of abundance is scarcity. So everyone has experienced scarcity in some way or form in some part in their life. And for me, as growing up, there was financial scarcity. Mm. And we tend to make decisions about our lives as an anecdote to something that was missing. Right. Yeah. Whether it's like, oh, I had a boyfriend that wasn't affectionate, then you get the boyfriend that's super affectionate or whatever yeah. it might be. <laughs> um, and so for me, it was going into finance was financial security. It was there was always going to be a job there. It was good pay. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was really about what I was looking for in my life and what I was good at, but not what I was passionate about. And I think a lot of us make those types of decisions. But I, I was pretty good at it. Yeah. <laughs> I was the only woman on a trading floor. I was the only woman on a global venture capital team, you know, and uh, it was an interesting place to be. But as the only woman on the trading floor, I was witness to a lot of poor communication and and even worse management. And, you know, I had people pitching me that they wanted me to invest in their hedge funds. And and I'm sitting there going, that's not how you get my money. Mm, (laughs) Very good. Uh, so really it started because I was the one who said, oh, let me go on recruiting for my accounting firm. And, oh, let me teach and onboard the new hires. And, oh, I'll do a class on capital asset pricing model for the newcomers because those were the things I loved. And I was trying to fit them into where I was. And I think what we need to do and probably what a lot of your listeners are doing is is designing their ideal. They're um, creating the careers and the businesses that – fulfill that passion. Right. And and I can relate to exactly what you're saying, because I went into accounting because I had to choose a major by year year three. I mean, I've taken all my classes and I'm like, oh my goodness. And so accounting was just a job for me and, and it could be a good job and on and on. And so I can relate to taking the secured path. And it took me till I was almost probably 45 to 50 to go through this shift of, no, I, I'd like to inspire women business owners and I would like to have a podcast, which you told me that you told me that 20 years ago, we didn't really have them. But I mean, it's so I relate to what you're saying in the terms of I'm going to follow a passion. I'm going to go because something in my life happened like lack of communication. The great thing is, is that you, you figured it out and you did it. I figured it out and didn't do it. I figured it out when I was 19 in my oh. sophomore year of college that I didn't like it. But I was like, oh, it's too late to change. <laughs> yeah. No, too late. Oh, my goodness. You know, I mean, I, I did figure it out because I went through just a time in my life where I said, I, I want to do something that has impact. And this isn't it. And and so I just went some down some other path, still stating accounting. And unfortunately, I'm with a company that allows me to do it. But I do understand always taking on something else in accounting that most people don't want to take on. Like, can you can you do a podcast for our company? You know, uh, most of, most of my CPA people are going to go no. So, but you well, know, isn't the, that fascinating? It because is. You are actually, um, you know, in the, embodying some of the connectors' mindsets because I did the same thing when I was still, still in finance. I went to the CEO of the company and said, hey, I'm going to be doing this on the side, and I just got appointed to NYU as an adjunct professor, and here's the, the classes they offered me. Which do you prefer I take? And so it's that communication, that relationship, that connection that you had with the organization that allowed you to have the flexibility to do what you want to do and still have that you know, <laughs> soft landing, that, that safety net um, as you're building it out. And so... Um, I, I applaud you for for figuring out that that communication, that relationship can um, make that difference for those people who are out there listening and thinking, I want to do that, I want to do that, and I'm scared. Well, um, what would be your ideal and how can you make that happen? Right. And I'm sure we'll talk about this as we can, as we flow into connection, which by the way, I bought five of your books on um, Amazon <laughs> on connection because they intrigue me so well. And I'm going to give them out to people in my office for our women's initiative. When I was, when I shifted and decided I'm going to do things that are more about what I would be good at or like, 
one of the things was how can I make a connection to my partner who is this great big audit guy and tax guy and they're energized by the IRS code? How do I make a connection with them, you know? And so I think that's why I was really attracted to this subject matter that you um, have addressed and obviously built a, a wonderful company on. So, uh, but I do want to, you know, I don't want to want to talk about COVID-19. Everyone's I'm kind of tired of talking about it, but it's kind of a reality of we have this new normal, which has really affected connection. So I would love to open up, just give us some of that insight on this new normal and connection. How did you deal with that over this last year? Absolutely. And, you know, social isolation is so detrimental. It is actually more detrimental on your health and mortality than obesity Mm. or smoking. Yeah. And so as you put it out there, it it feels like we are all isolated. Um, But I actually think there's been some really positive outcomes of this pandemic on connection because for those that are working and they're working virtually, what we have happen is we're getting a window into people's full lives. Mm-hmm. A lot of times we have our work person and our, you know, personal person yeah. and they don't cross and they have to cross now. There's no way that they can't cross. And I actually think it's going to create more empathetic and more connected cultures in organizations when we are back in person, because you can't keep the cat off your keyboard and the mm-hmm. dog from barking and the kids from all of a sudden, <laughs> my son came into my husband's office after being outside for an hour in the freezing cold and then put his hands right on my husband's face <laughs> while he was on camera. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's what kids do. And, you know, and, and he didn't know it. He was just like, ah, I'm going to get him, you know? Yeah. And so there's this beautiful thing where we have this window um, and it is making us feel more connected to those that we work with. We are opening up and sharing and being more understanding. And so I think there's some really great things that have come out of it. Now, there's, of course, challenges because I'm like you. I am energized by other people. Right. I find that this time has given me the excuse to reach out to those that we haven't been in touch with or that we're tentative to reach out to because it's pretty simple to just say, hey, how are you holding up? Right. How's it going for you? And, you know, it might not create a long conversation and maybe it will, but either way, you have just rekindle that connection. And I will tell you, I've had more backyard, socially distanced barbecues with my friends from college and my neighbors and all these people because we're all seeking that opportunity. Right. Don't you find that you appreciate it more when you do have interaction and connection (laughs) because of this time? I mean, I definitely am like, oh my gosh, I get to see you today or it, it, it's a bigger deal. And I've also been more particular about who I see or even connect with on Zoom. Do you find that that's a positive thing that I would narrow down my connection so I have a better one? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, there is no good or bad, okay. really. Um, and, and I don't want people to think there's one right way to do things. If what you're doing is working for you, then I applaud it. And as long as you are staying connected, then you're good if it's working for you. Um, There is the idea of going deep in certain relationships or going wide. And it's a matter of what you need or want in the moment. So when we think about the connector spectrum, right? So just to give the framework for your listeners, there is um, a spectrum of connection, right? So you can be a non-connector, emerging, responsive, acting, or you can get to the upper echelons of connectors, people who really prioritize relationships in everything that they do, to the super connector, niche connector, and global super connector. So if you want to get to the top, you have to have not just deep connections, but broad connections, Mm. because it's that breath that gives you access to different thinking and, um, you know, up and down the ladder and across industry and across demographics and geographics. And really, you will find that you can be more innovative with access to varied thinking. Awesome. I love that. I got, I'll have to think on that. I, I love the way you said that. Now, let, let me ask you this. How do we leverage the benefits of a virtual environment 
to create personal connection in a thriving network? So the virtual world is just one more channel, right? So when we think about connection, there's so many channels we can connect over. Yes, we have the face-to-face, we have the large group networks, we have the phone, we have text and instant messaging and Instagram and social media, um, and we have Zoom and, and FaceTime. So there's tons of channels. And really, in this time, we've lost a few of those face-to-face yeah. options, but we still have all the other channels. And I always say the more channels you connect over, the stronger the roots that connection will bind. So let's use the channels that we have accessible to us. And honestly, the virtual uh, video chat channel, whether you use Skype or Zoom or Teams or FaceTime, the video component is so valuable. I've had clients that I've coached for six months, never met in person, and have had strong, successful relationships. Wonderful. I had a person working for me. She still works for me. We're probably going on five years. Never met her in person, and she's like a little sister. Wow. And it's because we will connect on screen. So we might not be in the same space, but we are in each other's space. And we're in each other's face. Yes, know? yes. Well, you know, I, I, I've done this probably almost seven years. I've had a woman's conference. Brady Ware has sponsored a woman's conference. And we started the first year with 135. And I thought, man, I did such an awesome job, you know. Well, by year six, we had had 350 people, national speaker. And the, the whole point of the day, and it was about a day and a half, was the connection you got you know, it was that one-on-one, it was all my four offices coming to the event as well as, you know, national speakers. You got to meet the panels, you got to do all that thing. And and when um, COVID hit in March, we had such an amazing lineup of speakers and panels and we had to cancel. And that was kind of my defining moment meltdown of, I don't want to do a virtual conference because the connection is the thing when you're there, the energy in the room, you know? And so I really had to learn about how do I leverage the benefit of this time and moment because we're going to do the conference this year because it's too important to do. And I'm not going to get to do it in the same way, but I'm going to use the benefits right now that we can around us. But it's hard to do that. It's just so hard for me. I I just, but I got to do it, right? Because the conference is more important to have than how I want to have it. Does that make sense? I totally get that, and I feel you. But, you know, let's, let's put it a little twist on it. Okay. Right? I agree. There's nothing like face-to-face. And the kind of organic way that connections form when you're just mulling about a space or getting coffee or in the ladies' room line, because, you know, you always meet people in the ladies' room Absolutely. line. Absolutely. <laughs> Best <laughs> um, relationships, right? Oh, my yeah. God. I hired somebody at the dog park, but, like, yeah. <laughs> supermarkets and bathrooms, I meet people all the time. Um, <laughs> but what I would say is there is an advantage to doing it in this virtual format that can really help some people that struggle in those environments where they find it overwhelming to attend these events, Mm -hmm. to go up to strangers. When you have to just force them into a breakout room, they don't have to do it for themselves. When you give them a topic to discuss in that breakout room, when you call on them, you give them a floor and an opportunity that, that they don't necessarily raise their hand to take themselves, but will step into when offered. No, that's that's great. Again, thank you for helping me see that. I don't I don't know why I haven't seen that side because it is you are right. Plus, the other thing is is I'll be able to have people from Pennsylvania could be on if they wanted to versus just Central Ohio. Absolutely. That's the other awesome thing is that now people have access so far and wide. I did a keynote in Australia one day and I did a keynote in Britain like literally seven hours later. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Of course, From you and I home. would still would rather have gone to Australia, right? <laughs> oh, for, for sure. sure. I said, next time I'm coming in person <laughs> exactly. and the whole family's coming, just saying, but, um, right. but it was really fun and I did something in Canada. And so we're still um, being able to bring people together. Right in ways that we weren't doing it before. No, and that's a great, great communication to my audience because think of the benefits that are that are there because of the virtual environment. We have to get our mindset to that. And some of these things will, will continue on and we'll be better for it. 
So in your book, you, you've written book, actually you have four books, The Connector's Advantage, you talk about the seven mindsets to grow your influence and impact, and you say it is the strength of your relationships that lead to your success. Let's talk about those seven mindsets and, and that strength that you're talking about. Can you give us insight on that? Absolutely. And I can probably talk on this for an hour on its own, so I'll, <laughs> I'll stop every once in a while so you can jump back in. Okay, I will. Uh, so first of all, let me define what I mean by the connector's advantage. Whatever it is that you're working on, whether it is um, new job, promotion, starting a business, getting a referral, getting a new client, even health and happiness, you are going to get there faster, easier, and better through relationships. And so that's what the advantage is faster, easier, better results. And anybody can adopt these attributes and mindsets of a connector to reap that same advantage. So the seven mindsets are, and I'll, I'll list them, and then you can tell me which ones you want me to dive into. Okay. Connectors are open and accepting. They have a clear vision. They come from a place of abundance. Connectors trust. They are social and curious. They're conscientious, and they have a generous spirit. Well, I'd like you to do them all, and we could just have an hour together. How's that? <laughs> no, I um, I definitely like the generous spirit when you said that. And I, uh, what was the first one you said? Open and accepting, clear open and vision. Accepting. Let's talk abundance. about op- yeah. Let's talk about opening and accepting. I, I that hit me right off. So let's talk there. So you know, this is kind of the foundation is to be open and accepting. And and by the way, these seven mindsets are not linear. It's not like you have to do one and then you can do the next. Okay. They enable each other, right? Got so um, to be open and accepting is not just open and accepting of somebody else, right? So we have a tendency to um, form conclusions very quickly, and that's a natural thing. It's not a judgment. It is a necessity because we're taking in so much information. Our minds have to process and form conclusions very quickly. To be open is to stay open to being wrong. It is to slow your thinking down enough to allow additional information to come in to continue to form before conclusions are made. And there's four questions that I have people ask themselves. And by the way, you don't have to ask all four questions, but if any one of these questions come in your mind, it will slow your thinking down. And what I call it is staying in a place of curiosity versus conclusion. The four questions, what don't I know? Right, so if something happens, some situation happens, somebody says something, well, what, what don't I know? The second question is, what could be another way to interpret that? Or what could be another reason for that? And, and sometimes it's coming up with crazy reasons, like, why were they late? Well, the obvious ones is they, they were irresponsible or they don't care. And the crazy ones could be the body snatchers came and took them in the pod and the pod wouldn't <laughs> open and they couldn't get back in time. You know? That and, sounds and like social media coming, today. So, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> right? So sometimes coming up with the crazy reason will slow your thinking down and say, OK, wait, I don't I don't know the answer. Let's see if I can get more information before I decide. Yeah. Um, the third is what if I'm wrong? Mm. What's the impact to the relationship or to the work? And the last one is, what am I trying to be right? I've, I've come to the conclusion in this last year that I ask more questions than I do just rambling. Like, I ask questions so I have answers. And I love the way those questions flow. But I, you had me at slowing down your thinking. I mean, that yeah. is a crucial skill set to me. I wish I had that. Like, how do I slow that down so I can make not a judgment – right? But <laughs> maybe a conclusion is a better word. So, so yeah, that's, that's just what huge. we do. And so we just need to slow it down and that will keep us open. But when I do talk about open and accepting, I'm not just talking about being open and accepting of others. I'm talking about being open and accepting of ourselves. Got it. And okay. of, of our unique uh, charms, I call them. You know? <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, I love the fact that you're ask. You're, you're almost. I can visualize myself asking these questions in my mind before I say something. I don't know if that's yeah, what you and you mean. don't have to ask them all. Yeah, honestly, one or two of those will slow your thinking down enough to say maybe I should need to pose a question to take more information in. Okay. I love that. Now, let me ask you, I know you said, tell me the mindset you want to talk about. So I'm going to ask it this way. What's the mindset that you probably struggle with the most from your seven? 
Oh, personally, for me, it's abundance. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Well, yeah, we, we started talking about it a little bit earlier about that anecdote to our life. And, and um, because I grew up with scarcity, mm-hmm. um, we tend to be very protective and defensive. And, um, you know, that is a scarce mindset. And it was a, a very challenging for me to shift out of that. And it, 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 it continues to be challenging, right? And so I have, it's a practice to yeah. adopt an abundant mindset. Now, let me be clear. An abundant mindset is not Pollyanna. Everything's great. Right, right. <laughs> uh, abundance is about the possibility of it being better than it is. Okay. And not even the possibility, but the probability. And to work towards that likelihood. Um, so it is a belief. And, you know, it is about not comparing yourself against other people, right? So that's one of the habits and the practices of abundant mindset. Because there's somebody who's always going to do better, And there's somebody who is always going to do worse, but you really want to like compare yourself against what you are working towards and your goals. It is about understanding that envy uh, and jealousy are normal feelings and you're allowed them. (laughs) I remember somebody who um, she had worked for me and, and she got, this amazing sports client that I was like, oh, I am so jealous. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I could have been like, ah, oh, you know, beating myself up. Like, why didn't I do that? How come I didn't get them? And how did she get access? And, right, and, and I could have gone down that rabbit hole of beating myself up mentally and, and being almost resentful. And instead I was like, okay, how can I learn? How did you do that? You know, yeah. <laughs> do you need somebody else to help you? You know, and, and I could be happy for her. And, you know, it doesn't mean that jealousy wasn't there as well. But it had its space, and it didn't take over. Right, right. Um, and there's one other habit that has really helped me maintain an abundant mindset, especially during this time of COVID. And I know we don't want to stay on there, but, you know, it, it's, it is a challenging time. And it's very easy for us to be negative. It's very easy for us to say, this is awful, and that's awful, and this is going wrong. And when people say, how you doing, for the last year, I would exhale, right, because, you know, there is a lot of weight with everything going on. Right. And then I would say, feeling grateful. Very good. And I would list all the reasons why I was feeling grateful. Because, you know what, I have kids that are old enough that they can actually help manage their virtual school. Mm -hmm. I have a space where each kid can be in a closed room and do school. And I can do my work. Uh, we have good internet connection. Like, I have two dogs that are, you know, keeping us from being only in the house. You yeah. know? <laughs> like, I would just list off all those things. And that practice of gratitude uh, is a really great way to adopt that abundant mindset. And I'll give a, a technique that everybody can adopt, whether you're in COVID or not. And it's a little small habit. Um, there's two ways to implement it. Um, and it's basically a daily question. So you can do it at the dinner table with other people. You can say, what was the best part of your day? What was the highlight of your day? Anything like that. Um, I actually have a sign in my son's room because he tends to be negative. Okay. And it it says, um, today might not be a good day, but there is good in every day. I like that. And so my question to him would be, what was the good in today? Very good. Boy, I'm so mesmerized listening to you, I, but I'm supposed to be uh, interviewing you, but I'm like, I'm mesmerized going, yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, <laughs> yeah. So how does your son respond when you do that to get that mindset? How does he, how does he respond? Well, I stopped asking for highs and lows and I stopped asking how was your day because he would only tell you the bad stuff. Yeah. So it became a habit of tell me something good first, then you can tell me everything else. Okay. But just to start with the good. And, and again, it is a practice. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, it, these things don't necessarily come naturally. We are wired a certain way. Um, so that daily question to yourself, and, and there could be other questions. Um, you know, one question I would ask is, did I make somebody smile today? Or how did I make somebody smile today? Or what one kind thing did I do today? Because I would feel good if I did something nice. Very good. Well, I, I hate the, the fact that we're already wrapping up because I could talk to you for a long time. I, I love I love um, where you're coming from. I'm glad I've ordered the book. I'm really excited about it, learning, just developing the mindsets. I know for myself, through 2020 and going into 2021, which my 
first podcast of the year was it's 2021 so what you know it's still the same day but i've learned to separate branches and twigs branches have life rooted to a tree there's life there and twigs are for burning on the fire and are temporary and i've learned to separate those so that i have the right mindset it's just worked it's worked well for me so but i really want to dive into your seven mindsets with the book so but let's let's kind of wrap up this way i'd love for you to give you know just one takeaway to my audience that you would want them to hear that they will because hopefully they've they've made it through this long and they'll just take that away and chew on it what would it be to keep connecting and to keep connected because um, it will make that difference in not just your professional success but just how you feel on a daily basis of knowing that you have a network of people there to support you and i will share with you that um my family is going through some health issues, and the support that poured in from my community brought me to tears. Mm. Um, so build it because um, not because you need it, but because um, it is going to make you happier, it is going to make you healthier, and it's going to be there if ever you do need it. Wonderful. Well, Michelle, I certainly appreciate you coming on today, uh, your time. You're very busy, uh, but you are will- so willing to be here with with my audience. And, and again, we are grateful. I did buy your book on Amazon. Um, you do have three other books. Can you give me the titles real quick? Sure. Uh, well, really, the two books to focus on is my first book was called The 11 Laws of Likeability. Okay. And The Connector's Advantage is actually a follow-up to that book, so okay. they go well together. Okay. Um, but I also wrote two books on interviewing. One is just for veterans. It's called Heroes Get Hired. It's actually free. Okay. Any veteran or their spouse can get that um, on Amazon or on my website. And um, the other one's called Nail the Interview, Land the Job. I would love to hear from your audience. So they can always find me at my website, which is Michelle with two L's, Tillis Letterman, and it's L-E-D-E-R-M-A-N.com. And on that site, you can um, get a uh, free quiz to figure out what level connector you are. Um, I have lots of fun giveaways. So if you join my community, you will get a video series. You'll get free chapters from the books. uh, You'll get a, a branding exercise. Got lots of fun stuff. And I love to hear how you found me. Okay. Well, we will um, have your bio and your resources and your social media places. We'll have that all connected to this podcast so that you can learn more about Michelle um, and what she does. Um, I am Betty Collins and so glad you joined me today. Inspiring women, it's what I do. And I leave you with this. Being strong speaks of strength, but being courageous speaks to having a will to do more and overcome. As your career advancements continue, your financial opportunities will grow. You need to be prepared. And you can do that by going to our website, bradyware.com, to find out more about us and the accounting services that we provide. All this and more about the podcast can be found in the episode show notes.